What do you do when uncertainty is in front of you? When you feel like you're falling apart at the seams? It's only human to be afraid. But Dr. Tony Evans says Christians have the option to be superhuman. You have to choose to trust God in the dark. This is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. Depending on God isn't that hard when life is sailing along, but when your problems pile up to the point where you can't see where you're going, it can be difficult to hold on to hope. Let's join Dr. Evans as he tells us what it takes to trust God in the dark. Many are confused, weary, tired, frustrated, lost, perhaps a bit afraid. And so in contemplating the concept of hope and believing that God is doing something even when nothing is happening. I was taken to three of the great verses of the Bible, verses that I have referred to on numerous occasions but have never preached on. In a little book that if your pages get stuck, you'll never find it. In fact, some have been looking for it since the beginning of service. The book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a prophet who's confused. He's got some questions. The second verse of the first chapter, he says, how long, O Lord? Will I call for help and you not hear me? Anybody ever felt like that? God, you taken too long. Now, you know if the preacher feels, he's a prophet, if the preacher feels God is taking too long, what the congregation must think. So one problem that he's facing is God is taking too long to come through. Anybody ever feel, anybody ever feel? God, God I believe you stuff, but you're slow. Even the prophets struggled with the slowness of God. God was not only moving too slow, but his movements were very confusing. He couldn't make sense of it. In fact, God responding to his statement says in chapter 1, verse 5, look among the nations, observe, and be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe it if it were told to you. So you're taking too long and I can't figure you out. Now that's a double problem. One problem is God appearing to move too slow and another problem is an inability to understand what he is doing because it seems so contradictory. In this particular prophecy, he was going to raise up an evil people called the Babylonians to discipline his people, which causes Habakkuk to say in verse 13, your eyes are too pure to approve of evil. And you cannot look on wickedness with favor. So why do you look in favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they are? In other words, it's not fair. I know I'm bad, but they worse. You're pure, but you're using them more than you're using me. It's not fair. So you're taking too long. I can't figure out what you're doing. And a little bit I do know is not fair. So you're not the only one who thinks these thoughts about God. Now, it's hard to say it because you sound so unspiritual, you know? It's a lot easier to say, he's going to fix it. He's able. He's a, he's, a, he's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. He's a rose of Sharon. He's a bright morning star. He's bombing Gilead. It's a lot easier to say that. But when you're by yourself and you're thinking your real thoughts, 
while you believe in him, while you know God is real, there are those times where you have to raise some real questions. Why are you moving so slow, taking so long? Why are you so confusing? I don't understand you. Because what you're doing contradicts what I know about you. Well, the good news is you're not alone. The prophets, he's not the only one, had to struggle with the methodology of God. In fact, he says in the second verse of chapter 3, the last chapter of this book, Lord, I have heard the report about thee and I fear. You're taking too long. I'm confused. It's not fair and I'm afraid. A combination of negatives and he's the preacher. There are only three chapters in this book, but it begins off in a pit, but it ends on a peak. It begins down in the despair. Physically, he's a wreck. He's a nervous wreck. Look at the language used in chapter 3, verse 16. I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay entered my bones, and in my place, I trembled. That's a nervous wreck. Physically, I am just done, distraught. I'm falling apart and unraveling. At Does anybody ever felt like they were unraveling? That life was unraveling, just going every which way. Chaos here. Chaos when you get up. Chaos at home. Chaos at work. Just unraveling. That's the situation. Glad the past is behind you, but really uncertain about the future in front of you. That was his problem. And he's got to wait quietly, he says, at the end of verse 16. For the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. In other words, what he was looking forward to wasn't too exciting to look forward to. His future looked kind of dim. Distress, he called it. I can't take another year like this last one. And yet I don't see much hope for improvement. I wonder if there's anybody here like that today. You just don't see anything. But in the last three verses, after he's taken three and a half chapters to tell you his struggle, his frustration, his confusion, his fear, he comes down to three verses. Let me read them one more time. Though the fig tree should not blossom, though there be no fruit on the vine, though the yield of the olive should fail, though the field produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the field and there be no cattle in the stall, yet I will exalt in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, he has made my feet like hinds feet and he makes me to walk on my high places. There are, from the world's standpoint, the non-Christian world standpoint, the three options that are generally given uh, by the world or that people take as they look at negative situations in their life. One way is to resign yourself. That's the way it is. You kind of just say that that's the way it is. That's the way it's going to be. And so uh, people who resign always let you know that they're in that resigning mode because they sigh a lot. <sighs> How you doing? <sighs> What's going on? <sighs> they just resign. They just, that's the way it is. There is a second way that people deal with life when it doesn't seem to offer a future, and that is detachment. In other words, they distract themselves so they don't have to think about it. If I can come home and turn on the television, 
I, I can be distracted by the shows. If I can perhaps take drugs, I can feel good enough to be distracted from the pain. If I can party hardy, then I can let that erase. The only problem with detachment is that it's camouflage. No, but it doesn't fix anything. It, it just hides it and only hides it for a little while. So you have to be perpetually entertained to perpetually not think about it. But it's always underneath. You always know it's there. Dr. Evans will tell us more about how to deal with our stress and disappointment when he comes back in a moment to continue this message from his 12-part series, Where is God When It Hurts? This two-volume collection will teach you how to overcome bitterness, brokenness, and that feeling of being lost. And if you contact us by tomorrow, we'll send you all six CDs in Volume 2 of this set as our thank you gift when you help support Tony's ministry with a contribution of any size, large or small. And because today is Giving Tuesday, every gift you make will be doubled. That's right, doubled, thanks to a generous friend of our ministry who's promised to match whatever you give today up to $5,000. Altogether, we're trusting God to provide $20,000 by midnight tonight to keep Tony's teaching on this station, train and encourage pastors and their families, and equip more churches to break down barriers, work together, and impact their communities. Giving Tuesday is traditionally a day to support what you believe in, so if you believe the alternative is touching lives, including your own, we really need your help. Please visit TonyEvans.org by midnight tonight and let Tony know he can count on your support while this matching gift opportunity is still available. And then let us send you Volume 2 of Where Is God When It Hurts as our way of saying thanks. Again, that's TonyEvans.org or let a member of our resource team help you by calling us day or night at one 800 800 3222. 1-800-800-3222. Well, right now, let's get back to Dr. Evans and our message for today. There's a third way that people seek to deal with their uncertainty or struggle, and that is, or we'll call it bravado. Bravado. Take it like a man. Hold your chin up. You the man. Be the man. You can, I can handle it. I'm a real man. I can take it. I can face it. And you just say, I'm not going to let life get me down. And you kind of kick in the power of positive thinking. You say, well, I'm miserable. Uh, my life is not going anywhere. But that's okay because I'm a man. I can take it. My mama raised me to handle anything. The only problem with bravado is when things get bad enough, all the pep talk in the world won't help you. Pep talk is good, but pep talk doesn't last. It's like having a pep talk before a football game. At halftime, the score of 52 to nothing, you're losing. The coach come at halftime talking about pep talk. After a while, reality sets in. Okay, we ain't gonna win. And after a while, all the pep talk in the world is not going to do it. You've experienced that. You come to church, heard a sermon preached, and got pepped up. You came to church like this, you heard the sermon, go, yeah, yeah, I'm going to make it. Yeah, you fired up. Yeah, yeah. Five minutes after the benediction. Shucks, this stuff ain't going to because in religious pep talk, it's not enough. So the question we face today is, what do you do when God is taking too long? What do you do when uncertainty is in front of you? What do you do when you are afraid? What do you do when you feel like you're falling apart at the seams? Resignation. That won't do it. Detachment. That's camouflage. That, that hasn't addressed anything. Bravado only goes so long. Habakkuk says in verse 18, I will exalt in the Lord. 
He says, even though I have my questions, even though I have my confusion, even though I don't see solution number one in sight, and even though God does not make sense, rather than pretend that nothing is wrong, I am going to exalt in the Lord. That is, I am going to trust in the reliability of God even when I can't see him or what he is doing. I am going to choose to believe in the reliability of God even in the dark. Learning to trust God in the dark when you have no support for your faith other than who you know him to be. That is the only content you have. Who you know him to be. You appeal to two things. His character, what he is like, and his works, what he has already done for others, whether you or someone else in the past. Let me say that again, it's critical. Faith is only meaningful to the degree that its object has meaning. People always say, I'm going to have faith, I'm going to have faith. That's never the question. The question is, in what? What is the object of faith? To believe is a meaningless term until you tell me what you are believing. Belief only matters if the object has substance. We respond to our circumstances because our circumstances affect us. But he has to make a choice. It is the choice that every believer here today has to make. And that is the choice as to whether you will choose to believe God. That is the question. Will I choose to believe God? I have to believe two things about God. I have to believe, number one, his character. What he told me he is like. And I have to believe it in the dark. I can't see it. I don't feel it. But since he can't lie, it must be true. You've got to know that you can count on his character. But then you've got to believe something else. You've got to believe his works. That's another reason why you need to know the Bible because you've got to know what he did yesterday. You see, you got to know what he did yesterday. Habakkuk spends verses 3 through verse 15 rehearsing what God did yesterday of chapter 3. He talks about, he alludes to the Red Sea. He alludes to David killing Goliath. He alludes to all of these historical things. Why do you need to know what God did yesterday? Why is it important for you to know what he did in the past, in the Bible, in the life of your mama, in your friend's life? Why do you need testimonies? Because of this, he is the same yesterday today and forever the reason why you've got to know what he did is because what he did he can still do because he does not change we call it the immutability of God his methods vary but his abilities don't look at chapter 2 verse 20 you've all read it, it was said spoken here this morning but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. That means shut up. Be silent, that means be quiet. All right? The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be quiet. Now, to understand it, you got the verses before it talks about dumb idols that people look to for solutions. They can't speak. They can't talk. You have to set them up, break them down. And they are dumb. But the Lord is in his holy temple. 
Let all the earth, that's you and me, we on the earth, let all the earth be silent before him. Now, why do you need to know that? When you can't figure it out, don't get a headache over it. When you can't solve it, don't stay up all night trying to figure it out. God knows how to tell you what he wants you to know. And if he's not informed you of anything more than he has informed you of, you go to sleep. And be, stop fussing, cussing, and complaining. And be silent before the Lord. In other words, let him do what he's going to do. Leave God alone. He is not a dumb idol. He is not a lifeless being. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent. What do you do in a temple? You worship. Look, in your confusion, you worship. In your lack of clarity, you worship. In your emptiness, you worship. In your despair, you worship. You simply say, Lord, all I can do is adore you in your temple because I have no explanation for anything that's going on right now. None. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And so he calls for an act of faith. You remember Peter. Peter said, Lord, let me walk on water. I want to walk on water. Are you walking on water? I want to walk on water. And Jesus bid him come. He said, come on, Peter. Peter stepped out the boat. That's risky. It's a storm on a sea he steps out and walks on water Peter is walking on, on top of a storm but the Bible says he began to be distracted by the winds and the waves around him he got distracted in other words he began to focus on the circumstances when he took his eyes off the Lord and begin to focus on the situation. He says to himself, you fool. What are you doing out here walking on water? Now, Kelly began to talk to himself. He was doing fine. As long as he was talking to Jesus, he was walking on water. But the moment he started looking at how bad his situation was, the Bible says, and he began to sink. And you will sink every time when you focus on your circumstances and not focus on your solution. You're not focused on the Lord. He began to sink. And then it dawned on him, if I don't change my focus, I'm going to keep going down. Yeah. And then the Bible says, he looked up and said, Lord, save me. When he changed his focus back to what got him started in the first place, he began to walk on water again. Are you tired of going down? You get up on Sunday, but you going down on Monday. Your favorite song is going down one time. You, know, you just keep going down and you keep going down and you keep going down and you find yourself drowning. God is inviting you to look up. Keep your eyes on him. I may not get rid of the storm, but you'll be walking on it. It won't be walking on you. Dr. Tony Evans with some bright rays of hope for people going through hard times in a message he calls Trusting God in the Dark. If you'd like to review the full-length version of this lesson, copies are available on CD or DVD. Or ask about getting this entire 12-message series we told you about earlier called Where is God When It Hurts? Remember, Volume 2 of this powerful collection is yours as our thank you gift when you help support Tony's ministry with a contribution of any size. And if you do that before midnight, your gift will be doubled on this Giving Tuesday thanks to a generous matching grant. But the deadline is only hours away, so don't wait. Click your way to TonyEvans.org now or call 1-800-800-3222 and let a member of our resource team help you. That's 1-800-800-3222. As we learned today, it's hard to hold on to hope when your circumstances have you pressed against the wall. Tomorrow, Dr. Evans explains how God's power can come through at our very darkest moment. I hope you'll join us then. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is made possible by the generous contributions of listeners like you.